Are you ready for your window shoppers to become paying customers? Equity Commerce is here to make that happen. We can help you automatically show the exact product visitors saw but didn't purchase on your site wherever they go on Facebook and Instagram using this magic called dynamic Facebook retargeting. To show these ads to your prospects today, sign up in your Equity Control Panel in the Marketing section and look for the Facebook Remarketing app. This is fully integrated into Equity and Facebook and so simple and effective you'll wonder why you hadn't done this sooner. Okay, back to the show. This is the Equid E-Commerce Show with your host, Jesse Ness, along with Richard Ote. Richie, happy Friday. Happy Friday. It's that day again. It pops up every week. I know. Cue. I know. I love it. I love it. So we get to head into the weekend. We get to have a good podcast here. Uh, I'm pumped because, you know, some of our favorite podcasts, no offense to our, our some of our other people that aren't on our favorites, uh, we love talking with store owners, creators, inventors, and so today we get to talk kind of like a triple threat here, so pretty pumped. Yeah, plus uh, one of our favorite parts of that is where they come up with the idea, and you know, just the origin story, the birth of their business, and uh, you'll hear when we get started how why we're pretty excited to hear how exactly did this particular idea come to fruition yeah i don't i don't know if we want to give this away but like think about it if you've ever just you've really had to go if you know what i mean you, <laughs> you just everything just, inside your body says i really need to go right now but i'm stuck in a car so uh i think there's there's people out there that might be able to connect with this so uh let's bring on our guest angela brathwaite brathwaite how are you doing I'm fantastic. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. I love it. I can tell you have a smile right now as we're talking. So so you're the founder of RoadTripPotty.com? Yes, I am. All right. So that was the spoiler for our little lead in there. So, uh, so Angela, tell us what Road Trip Potty is. Road Trip Potty is a portable female urinal that is anatomically designed for a female's body and it can store discreetly underneath the passenger car seat. It's designed in such a way that both younger girls um, and older women can use road trip potty and it is the perfect road trip potty companion. Um, you purchase it once, it stays in your car, and you'll never have to worry about where you're going to go when you're stuck in traffic and it needs to flow. <laughs> nice. A little Dr. Seuss action there. You're <laughs> <laughs> stuck and you need to go and got to flow. All right. We uh, got the tagline going for the <laughs> website. I love it. <laughs> so, you know, back to kind of when we were starting there at the beginning, where did this, where did this idea come from? What, what birthed this? So I had a, just a random workplace accident. I slipped. I had some knee issues and those knee issues required that I had to have knee surgery on each one of my knees. So after my first knee surgery on my right knee, I had to stay with friends. Um, my doctor's appointment was about 40 miles away and this was in Los Angeles traffic. And so it took anywhere between an hour to two hours, depending on traffic. With my big knee surgical brace on, um, we were always trying to figure out, number one, the best times to get a doctor's appointment because there was always traffic. And number two, which route to take because I was always going to have to go to the bathroom. And then once I got to a bathroom, let's say a restaurant bathroom, getting out of the vehicle was almost impossible before it was just, it was a problem. So I had a vision of what I wanted to use and I'd done my research and what I'd seen, those things weren't going to work for a person in my situation. And I went online to find this product that I had envisioned and I couldn't find it. And so I kept doing research and I had this idea, well, maybe it hasn't been invented yet. I checked the U.S. Patent Trademark Office. It had not been invented. And so I ended up inventing something that I needed personally. Wow. So first of all, it's amazing that this has never been invented before because this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that have to pee. Uh, let's just yep. let's just throw it out there. A lot of times <laughs> per day, like, you know, you got to go. 
And there's a lot of a lot of females out there because, you know, just, uh, hey, anatomy is what it is. Um, it is a little bit easier for men to be able to, to, you know, go in the car if they have to. It's maybe not always the nicest thing in the world, cleanest thing in the world, but it can it can happen. But for females, just not that easy. So, what you know, like just nobody had ever thought of this. Was there was there anything out there that you saw or was it just they just weren't going to work for you? There were some things that were out there that were not going to work for me. Um, And those things weren't specifically designed for females and specifically designed to use while being seated in a car. Okay. Yeah. So I'm guessing probably more like a hospital bedpan style stuff or something similar. Someone's in their house and they're just can't get up as quick and it's not really starting, stopping, breaking, turning, all that kind of stuff. Is that what you're referring to? That and the fact that it, it, uh, there were a lot of funnel type products that are out there. Um, what I found with the funnel type products is that number one, if you're not standing in a place for the funnel to allow liquid to void into, that was going to be a problem. So that's not going to easily work in your vehicle. And then with the funnel type things, um, especially if you're a little girl, you're asking a female to put something foreign close to her body. And that's not necessarily comfortable to do. So with road trip potty, you just sit. Hmm. So I have something that could easily be glossed over, but I don't want to. Do you have a entrepreneurial background in your family? I mean, there's some people have a problem and then they just kind of go on and do life and the problem was a problem and now the problem's gone, but you decided to turn this into something and you actually invented something. You looked at the patent office, you know what I mean? Like you, you took this to a whole nother level. Do you have any background with that or what inspired you to actually turn this into a product and sell it? So part of my background being that I grew up on a farm Um, with my grandparents, my grandparents were absolutely entrepreneurs. And I knew what entrepreneurship looked like because I had them as references. Um, And if you know anything about growing up on the farm, it's making sure that you've got enough product, you look at your seasons, growing seasons, weather conditions, um, planting, harvesting, a lot of variables to consider. So I used my my background from growing up on a farm to recognize if my grandparents could do it, I could do it. So that gave me the courage to actually move forward with this. But the other thing that really helped me was my background in education. I received my doctoral degree from University of Southern California, and I learned how to be a school site administrator. And so I understood budgeting, financing, um, making sure that materials were there, making sure that you have support for your staff, for your students. So through both elements, I was able to to combine those and again, realize that not only could I do this, this is an absolute need. And if all the things that I've preached to all of my students and staff over the years, over the decades, one of which is following your intuition, if I didn't do the same, then I was going to be a hypocrite. And I just couldn't do that. That's perfect. Yeah. I mean, you've been telling you now you're, you're living the, you're, you're living the reality that you'd been teaching. So that's awesome. So you saw this need, you had the need personally. Um, and then you mentioned checking out the patent office. So I, I imagine you looked all, you know, all over the place for this particular type of product. How did you, you know, give us the process of inventing and, you know, going to the patent office and, and, you know, like the process of invention is, is a crazy, crazy journey. So give us a little insight into that. So the first thing is, believe it or not, is figuring out which website to actually go to, because there are, there are so many fake websites that trick people into going on them as opposed to going to the United States Patent and Trademark Office by the United States government.gov, not .com, but .gov. And so 
once you're there, you literally start your search. It's just like opening up a dictionary, a traditional dictionary where you where you start with the word alphabet, and then you go with the word, and then you kind of like look at the origins of the word, look at the definitions, the applications. Looking up patents really is no different from that. And so I really commend the U.S. Patent Trademark Office on the simplification of how to start a patent search. And like anything with research, you you literally go through the process. You look at individual patents and you have to read to see what the claims are. You have to read to you have to look at the shapes, the designs of things. So before I did any of that, I actually sketched out what I had envisioned because I wanted to make sure that I kept with the fidelity of my idea and not look at somebody else's idea and absorb what they'd already created. So as I'd gone through the process of of sketching it out, literally on a yellow notepad, um, and then going to the patent trademark office, looking at drawings and, and reading the claims for some of the drawings, I could see that what I had on my piece of paper was nothing like what was in the things that I saw from the US Patent Trademark Office. And so, you know, sometimes you doubt yourself and you think, well, is this really that different? And I paid a company, and I'm not gonna name which one, <laughs> but I paid this, this, this company that you see on television um, to do a patent search for me. And their patent search came back that I had a unique patent, um, a unique idea. And then I started, I considered them and I looked at their fine print and in the language of the fine print, I, I could not sign with them. I couldn't work with them because they wanted a percentage of any profits that I made. Ah. And and had I not seen that, I would have gone with this company. And so I, from that point on, now that I knew that I actually had a product, um, an idea that I could possibly do something with, I started researching other companies to find a company that would help me get through the patent process without charging me an arm and a leg um, that didn't want a percentage of any profits that I made from anything that I'd done. And I did actually find that company. Um, and that company, and I will say their name, Mars Rising Network, they were phenomenal. I literally picked up the phone. I spoke to the owner. We spoke, I don't know, maybe two or three different times because I wanted to make sure that everything that they said on their website was exactly what they were going to do. And they did it. They helped me with the drawings. They helped me with creating the patent paperwork. Um, And when you look at my patents, you will see that the name on the patent is my name. I did not hire an attorney, but the company that I worked with gave me the tools to, to have my own patent, own my own patent. And now everything that I do is 100% mine. Wow, that's great. I mean... I think you're the first person we've had on the podcast that really went through the the patent process. And I do know, um, I think that's kind of a good note for people out there that, you know, when you go into this space, there are a fair bit of scammers or not necessarily that company was necessarily scamming you, but there's a, there's a, it's a bit of a shady world. There's a little underbelly there in the patent world. So you do need to be very careful. And thanks for sharing. Was it Mars Rising was the, the company you ultimately did go with that was a legitimate company that really helped you? Yes, Mars Rising Network. Okay. There's a little joke in there, too, that it's not Venus rising, but it's Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't catch that, the, Rich. There we go. Yeah. I used to know a lot about the infomercial business. I, I'm pretty sure they've done some pretty big stuff in that space, too. I can't remember exactly what products, but I, I think it sounds like they've helped the gamut. I'll look them up when you're done or when we're done. And now, Angela, so the... How long was this process from, you know, your first search at the U.S. Patent Office to, you know, finding the company and working on CAD drawings and and actually getting a patent? How long did that take? The first patent, it took about 
15 months, and that was the design patent from conceptualization to an official document from the U.S. Patent Trademark Office, about 15 months. Okay. The second, the second patent, which is a little bit more difficult to obtain, was the utility patent, because that's the one that has all of the claims and the language associated with what is permissible, what is not permissible. Um, that patent took about two years. Okay. So once you got your first patent, did you start the process of production knowing that it was patent pending and you were just saying, I'm going to move forward. I'm not waiting two years or what was that process? For me, absolutely not. I did not do anything with these patents until I had both the utility and the design patent. Um, what I know about the patent process is that there's a lot of people who will start a patent application and they, they've been told they can say patent pending, but because the U.S. Patent Trademark Office hasn't officially given you the um, documentation that says you do own the rights to this patent and any claims associated with it, um, just because it's patent pending does not mean it's going to be granted. And so I did not want to waste money, waste time, waste energy into starting manufacturing and production. And then the U.S. Patent Trademark Office would come back to me and potentially say, you know what, we're going to have to reject your claim. We're going to have to reject your idea because we found in blah, 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 this, which will make your idea null and void. So I waited. So were you doing other things during that time? Were you seeing if other products were being invented or, you know, because eventually, you know, you're, you're hoping you don't know. That's why you didn't take action yet. But you're hoping that this actually um, comes through and you get the patents and you sound very proactive, just the fact that you're doing it in the first place. So was there anything you were doing to move the company forward during that time? Because eventually there is this, you know, what is the content you're going to be creating? What are the things people are searching for? Were you seeing if anything else was popping up on the market in the meantime, or did you just wait until that was over? I did look at the market every now and then, but I did not focus on it. Um, my biggest focus at that time was, was working on healing and making sure that I reestablished mobility and that my physical things were addressed. So I really spent the time doing that. But in the back of my mind, I'm, you know, I'm keenly aware of I have this idea. I know what I'm going to call the product road trip potty. Um, so I spent my time doing that. And I'm really glad I did because once you get your patent, you've got 14 years with your patent, unless it's, you know, something else and, and you can get an extension of that. But in general, it's about 14 years. So I decided that once I actually had the patent paperwork, I knew that I had 14 years. And so I felt like I had more than enough time to develop whatever I needed to develop. But it was really important for me to reestablish my health and reestablish my mobility. All right. So you got the you got the patent. And now, now the the uh, game begins here. So you got to get this thing made. Now, yes. it's it's you know it's made out of a plastic type material. So generally, everybody's like, "All right, ship it to China, get it get it made there." You know, like what was what did you do for what was your, what was your manufacturing process? So I did have a conversation with someone from um, a Southeast Asian company, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they quoted me a price and. Um, I wasn't comfortable with that. I wasn't comfortable with having the product made out of the United States in my gut. I did not feel that that was what I needed to do. And so I started looking for U.S. manufacturing and it took me about a year to find U.S. manufacturing. Um, there is no blueprint on how to find U.S. manufacturing. And this was back in, I think like 2000. 15, 2016, when I was having this search. So a lot of U.S. manufacturing companies had already, I mean, they closed. So 
like everything else, I, I did research, I talked to people, um, and I found a company in California, and I was living in California at that time, and this company was about 30 miles from where I lived, and I visited them, I looked at their facility, because again, I wanted to make sure that what I think I'm getting, I wanna make sure that I am clearly getting everything here in the United States. So after visiting them, um, we had further communications, further talks, and they were the company that I actually started to work with and I still work with. So the one thing that I can say to people is, it is absolutely possible to find US manufacturing. And once you establish that relationship with your US manufacturer, you can call, you can visit. It just makes life so much easier to find a U.S. manufacturer. That's great. And, and you were only 30 miles away at the time, so you were able to actually go visit the, you know, you're not relying on pictures on a website. You're actually there meeting people and, um, you know, seeing the actual facility. That's great. Yes. Okay. So now that process, now from the patent, did you just, the patent's ready to go. Is there any steps to get it manufactured? Like, is there, you know, there's, is there CAD drawings for the, for the patent or is it just regular drawings and then CAD needs to happen after that? No, before you can get into the actual manufacturing, you've got to have your CAD drawings. And so I found a, another company that did the CAD drawings. And then I found another company that did prototyping. And back then prototyping was, um, not as prevalent and a lot more difficult to find. Now, prototyping is relatively easy because there's so many prototyping machines that are out there and available. But it took me a while. I found the prototyping. After I got my first prototype, then I needed to conduct some market research. I did focus groups. I had um, females of various sizes sit on the prototype, give me feedback. Um, and so I went through multiple rounds of getting prototypes to get road trip potty in the shape that would be what I thought to be a more of an average shape, given all the, the data and the details and the feedback that I'd received from the people that I've been working with. And then from that point, a mold was created. And once the mold was created, then I was able to actually go into mass production. Okay. Now, I'm now I I'm thinking in the back of my mind. There's a lot of steps here, and I'm thinking there's a lot of money involved here too. Patenting, CAD, um, prototypes, you know, all this. At this point, before you've sold anything, you're you're out quite a bit of money. Right? I mean, right? Like, yes, uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're really believed. I I mean, like, you know, it's inspiring that you're able to invent, but also inspiring that you you dished out a lot of money before you even made $1. So correct. All right. Well, uh, yeah, like I say, I'm inspired that you really believed in it. So, all right. So now we're, we're, we're good. We got, we're ready to rock and roll. We're, we're making some, we're making the, the road trip potty. How do you sell this darn thing? So, I mean, you know, we talked about before 50% of the world is a, is a potential market for this. Like it's, it's made for women. Everybody's got to pee. Um, but maybe everybody's not going to buy this immediately. Like, so how did you go about marketing this with it? It, it probably did not exist before. How did Correct. you start? So the first thing I did was make sure that I had a, uh, a website that allowed for purchasing. Um, and I looked at various ways to create a shopping cart for my website. And I actually chose Equit because uh, Equit was easy, easier than other things, believe it or not. And I was also looking for, once again, a company that had roots um, and employees within the United States. Oh, great. From, from all aspects of my business, I can definitively say it is really important for me to give back to our communities. Um, and that comes from my background in education. That just comes from my belief my beliefs. And so people that I've hired and people that I've worked with, I've only worked with U.S. manufacturers, U.S. graphic designers, um, Equid, which is, is in part a U.S.-based company. 
And so I found a web developer who was a U.S. web developer. They helped me to put the website together. We added Equid. And so Road Trip Potty is available on my website, roadtrippotty.com. Um, how I've been marketing it has been through uh, Google, um, Google Analytics, Google AdWords, the whole SEO component related to making sure Road Trip Potty pops up when people are doing Google searches related to urinals, female urinals, things of that nature. I also do social media marketing, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, just the, the basic general platforms related to social media. Those are the ways that I'm getting Road Trip Potty out. Um, I've also done some some local events, some trade shows. I've, I've been on panels. Um, I've done a couple of radio slash internet podcast interviews in the past. Um, but anything that I can do to get the word out to people is what I've been doing. Well, that's, that's great. And now, so backing up to like just the website creation and, and starting the market, did you have any experience in that area previous to starting this company? No. I didn't even have a Facebook account. Oh, all right. All right. Well, that's great. So you were able to figure this out. Like, you know, you, you had a web developer for the website. That helps to kind of kickstart everything and get it, get it going. But, you know, for, you know, learning SEO and marketing on, you know, Google and Facebook, like, did you, did you have any help with that? Or did you just kind of go just dive in and go through the process? My web developer gave me direction on in what to do and where to go. Mm -hmm. uh, he taught me a lot, gave me a lot of resources, things to look up and research. And I can honestly say as a small business owner, and I'm not even going to use the word small anymore. As a business owner, you have to figure out where is the best place to put your energies. And so after looking at SEO and, and you know, kind of playing around with that, I contracted that out to him because I need to be doing other things as the owner of the business. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned enough to realize that is beyond the scope of the things that I need to be doing on a daily basis. <laughs> so my, my, web devs, my web developer takes care of that. No, that's great. No, that's I, I think you need, everybody needs to know when there's certain things you want to do yourself and there's some things that, you know, that's, that's why there's this whole industry that supports website owners and, and online businesses. So, so that's great. So you, you were kind of outsourced SEO, um, but SEO is really comes from content. And I looked from on your page, there's a lot of content. You have testimonials on there, which I think were really helpful for me to start to learn the other, you know, the other uses of the product and other situations where it's useful. But, you know, for people listening, that's where you can, you putting in your keywords there, you know, like, female urinal or female portable urinal. Uh, I think those would probably be good common terms. And then you learn all these other things that you wouldn't have thought of before. Um, so Angela, do you d handle your own advertising on uh, Google and, and Facebook and such? My web developer um, and that, that company, which I absolutely love, uh, it's called uh, MTR uh, Web Development. They handle Google AdWords, Google Shopping, but I do the Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, all the other social media aspects of marketing. Okay. And now for on the social media side, how, and you mentioned you didn't even have a Facebook account before, so you definitely had to, you know, you're getting up to speed there on several things all at once. So, um, you know, kudos to you for having been able to figure that out. Um, you know, like what type of content do you put on Facebook, Instagram, because I mean, I'm just curious, what, what, what do you, what type of, what do you post on social media? So this is what's been interesting as I've, as I've had to create my own messaging because this product is one where I could use, um, negative ad campaigns to generate a lot of interest. I could use those negative ideas and scare people to think about the product and purchase the product out of fear. But I strategically decided not to do that because I believe that there's already enough fear and negativity 
in the world. And there's plenty of that in social media platforms. So I post ads, um, I create ads that are positive, that remind people, you know, you're traveling, but if you want relief, this is an option. Uh, I post things that are uplifting. Um, Every now and then I'll post a picture of traffic where I'm literally stuck in traffic and I remind people, you know what? I'm stuck in traffic, but that's okay because I have my road trip potty. (laughs) For me, it creates a sense of ease. I have less anxiety about traveling because I have my my safety piece here. I've got my road trip potty, which in many ways is like my bladder safety blanket. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting because totally completely understand and probably lean towards the same as you is not really a big fan of of negativity and using that as an ad campaign. But there are interesting elements with yours that you could prep for those scenarios without necessarily using fear kind of proactive. Because if you kind of take the analogy of you're getting stuck in traffic, well, you might have prepared to leave early enough and you might have used the restroom before you went. But I, too, was in Los Angeles for a while there. And I know how good luck with that, especially if you're around the 405. So, um, you know, I was thinking almost people who have these kits, um, disaster preparation or things. So you can still be positive, but you're understanding that that these sometimes um, I don't know, maybe seem negative events, but I mean, they're obviously not happy events, but, um, you know, prepping ahead of time and maybe partnering up with people who do um, hurricane evacuation or any sort of evacuation services or prepping any of that stuff, that might be a way to still be positive, but still take advantage of the knowledge that these events still do happen. I love that idea. And I think we're thinking along the same lines because I posted this week a um, an ad on social media surrounding exactly that. You know, it, it, the ad basically is a, a picture with a reminder of the things that people should be thinking about when evacuating. And that includes making sure you've got your cash, that you've got your medicines, um, that you've got food, uh, that you've got your emergency numbers. And then I have, you know, don't forget road trip potty. Yeah, I think that's that's great because there's, you know, that particular type of article that, or, you know, yours was an ad, but other people are, you know, they're basically typing that same type of article, uh, like evergreen, like this happens all the time, every time it's, You know, it's tornado season in the just recently in the Midwest. And then there's hurricane season in the, you know, the the Gulf Coast area. Like there's, um, you know, we're in California here. There's there was there's fire evacuations (laughs) seems like fairly regularly. You know, like there's these are all um, times for this to be brought up. And yes, these are. Yes, it's a negative event to to evacuate, um, you know, an area. But we're you know, you're trying to be helpful. And I think. Yes, you can write those articles, but other people are writing those articles all the time. And for you to insert your product in that discussion, I think is really helpful. And it gives you a, you know, there's something you can do with that often, right? Like there's people are writing these articles, you know, so there's a, I think there's a huge PR um, possibility for you, you know, because the product is so unique. And then when people are writing these types of articles, like they're, they're going to be happy to, to, to mention you. So I love that. Thank you. That's great. Yes. I will look into that. I'll, I will do more research with that. <laughs> we know you love your research, Angela. So, I mean, and, <laughs> and that one is, you know, PR can be kind of expensive to be honest with you. Like if PR agencies and things like, you know, a couple thousand bucks a month is like, that's where it starts. So there's ways around it. I mean, you could go, actually there's a website called help a reporter out H A R O. I don't know if it's, H-A-R-O.com. Yeah, it's Haro.com. Um, there's people that are write, they, they are writing these articles and they post what they're going to write about and then you can kind of pitch your product um, into them. I mean, I think 
Um, there's probably a lot of women's magazines in particular that would be useful. You know, like you're probably not going to make men's journal with this one, but, um, you know, like there's, there's just a lot of, a lot of people writing articles and, and on social media that this is a really unique, interesting product to, to insert in the, in the conversation. Yeah. And just to clarify real quick, it is, they do refer to themselves as Haro, but it's actually help a reporter.com. So if you want to do that, plus I would also say back to kind of the disasters and different things do happen. Um, just a looking when those scenarios happen uh, and donating your time and or some of those products could go a long ways too. you know, they're evacuating a girl's school or you, know, you never know what it is. Like there's there's many kind of workarounds that some people will think of it as you might be taking advantage of uh, people, but maybe you're just taking advantage of that as a marketing scenario, but you know your intent. Sounds like you're very in tune with your intuition. So I wouldn't have that discourage you. If you only walked around following ambulance or something, that might be a whole nother story. But, you know, there's nothing wrong with helping people out. I, I think it would be a, a wonderful thing if the world could get paid good money because they were helping people out. Right. I love that idea. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I was I was talking with Rich bef- before the podcast here, and I, you know that's uh, it's an it's an interesting product because when you need it, you really need it. Um, but unfortunately, you had to buy it ahead of time. So there's like, how can you how how do you market something like that? Because um, you know I, I don't know if this is available, but like I was thinking if if you could you know market via the Waze app or the Google Maps app that this only goes on to females when all the traffic roads are like red as can be, right? Like that there's a, you know, now that might be a little bit, um, <laughs> some people might be like, oh, great. I see this ad for Road Trip Putty now. <laughs> I need it right now, right now. Um, but That's when the not till drone delivery happens. Yeah. So. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. When we get drone delivery, <laughs> you can get it now, but um but I just thought it might be interesting. Like there's a there's a time when you really need it. And then if you can get people to buy it at that point, well, OK, you can't help them at this moment, but it's probably not the first time they had to go when they're stuck in traffic. So um, just think there's there's a lot you could do with with interesting marketing options. It's just your unfortunately, your product is almost not priced high enough to afford you know, too much advertising. You can't spend, you can't spend $50 to average, you know, an average, um, cost per acquisition for this when it's a $30 product. So that's a, a interesting case. I mean, you do, right. you do have a few other SKUs in there. I noticed. So if you were able and you wanted to kit and bundle those up and you could get the average cart value up, you know, I totally agree with what Jesse's saying, but if you could kind of focus on that, trying to maybe pre-bundle that whole pack and encourage them to buy the seat cover and a few other things, then, you know, uh, maybe even buy one, get a second one for a friend. You know, I mean, girls have friends, right? We know. Yes. And, and yes. I know this is probably politically incorrect, but they even go to the bathroom together quite often. So this yes, might be part do. of the fun. <laughs> <laughs> whole nother, don't mean to strike a, a visual for people here, but... <laughs> <laughs> we, we have women in our lives. We know we, we're not that uh, <laughs> blind to what goes on. So, um, but yeah, Angela, how many, like how many sales do you get now where they buy, where people buy more than one? How often? Um, so it's interesting that you asked that question because my first customers have become repeat customers and I'm finding that they're buying two and three additional after they've made their first purchase. And the reason they do so is because they love the product and they're buying them for their for their girlfriends. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I found out about us as women and the things that we don't talk about, we don't talk about how frequently we are holding it. It's the secret that's not a secret. Um, we, We don't talk about how dehydrated we are as women because we are concerned with consuming liquids because we're concerned where we're going to go when the liquid has passed through our bodies and our bladders are full. And so since we're not having these conversations, Road Trip Potty has become a way, a vehicle literally, for women to start having these conversations with their friends. And again, there are, there are 
customers who now are repeat customers buying two and three at a time because they're just they're they're giving them out to the people that they love and care about. Yeah, yeah that's that's fantastic. And I was going to offer one other piece when it comes to content creation. I love I've checked out your Pinterest and a couple of other things. You're you're actually covering a lot of interesting other things you know herbs they could eat for urinary tract infection you know just all all like just things to be proactive and take care of it not just only here's here's my potty and we all know or maybe not all of us but a lot of us in the marketing world know about the other company out there that that did some funny videos with um pottying and take something that is not necessarily something people want to talk about all the time and made some pretty viral videos. And so now I'll get into what specifics I was going to say. There was some tests done, actually quite a lot of tests on what actually creates a viral video. And although there'll be people who say they can create one for you, it's good luck with that, right? But there were, right. there were components. There were truly components that across the board they all had. And... Um, one of them was adventure, right? So in you could see how somewhere down the line you could tie in adventure. Uh, one of them was inspiration. Your story is definitely inspirational. One of them was surprise. I mean, the very nature of why you would want this with you is that surprise, right? Yes. Um, emotional, right? And if you think of your whole story through this whole process, it's emotional too. You were health challenge and you decided to, you know, just, it's a cool story. Um, and then the fifth one, which kind of goes back to the other one that I was talking about is comedy. And you obviously have a playful, you're very serious and you also are very proactive and good work ethic. It sounds like, but you can also tell you're very playful too. And I would not, I, I would say I would encourage you to possibly, use as much comedy in a situation like this as possible because I, I think you could really potentially hit a home run with uh, just trying some stuff out. And as a marketer, again, anyone who tells you they know exactly what to do is going to be blowing smoke. You, you take an educated guess and then you test things and you look at the data. I mean, if, if, if Hollywood knew exactly what movie to make, they wouldn't make so many flops but they try stuff until they find out that the avengers and then you make 18 version of the same movie but whole nother story (laughs) um but yeah i would really encourage you to kind of think of those when you make it because you kind of have all those elements entwined and it's really going to be just up to your imagination um how playful you want to be with this i love these ideas and this is this is one of the things that i've thought about in terms of how do I make the video, the videos, plural, that will tell the story, but will have the content and the material that um, inspires people to share the video? And what would be the, uh, the categories that I needed to make sure that I touched upon in a video that I created? So... The five things that you just mentioned, the adventure, the inspiration, the surprise element, the emotional element and the comedy element, like this is very timely hearing this again, because this is something that I've I've recently been thinking, where do I begin? So this is exactly where I need to begin. Awesome. You gave gave her the five steps for viral videos, you know, uh, no, I, I, and those are it. Like you to Rich's point, though. You might have to make several of them, and, and some will work and some will, will not work. Um, you know, but I do think b- because your product actually it really enables mobility for some people that may not want to take a three hour road trip, right? Like, or, or they, yeah, they don't want to drive to LA uh, because they know they're going to get stuck in traffic and it's, it's going to be painful, you know? Um, so I think it's really, there's an emotional piece there to it. And maybe your customers, particularly the people that have bought a couple times want to share a story, want to share a video uh, on Instagram or Facebook that, you know, like why they love this product. And, you know, and I think that's where the comedy comes in because if you keep comedy there, it becomes okay to share. Otherwise, you know, you're talking about a bodily function and then it's a little, it's a taboo, 
but the, exactly you know the yeah. comedy makes it more like yeah we can we can talk about this I, I mean you can literally in my opinion go completely over the top with some of it especially knowing your intent is actually really good on many levels like all levels sounds like um you could literally go over the top you could be like someone's in a movie theater and when everyone else is running out and they kind of wink at, you know, like, Hey, I'm good. You know, like, like literally there's things where, you know, someone would never actually do that. They're not going to bring it into the movie theater so they don't have to go, you know, but, but it would spread rapidly. I, I believe if you really, really embrace the comedy side of this, because to Jesse's point, um, it's people, they don't talk about this stuff much. And that's part of what those five elements, when it came to shareability, uh, it, if you really think of the things that people share, it almost always has at least one of those and sometimes multiple of those, or they don't get any shares. Right. Yeah. Well, in the, in the process, if you're, you know, so if you are thinking about a YouTube video too, there are ways where, you know, maybe these get put in front of videos that are talking about UTIs, right? That, you know, like clearly the person watching that has uh, has an issue. They want to be solved. This is potentially something they should be aware of. There's a lot of other places you can place it, but you can literally place your video in front of somebody else's um, somebody else's content. So, yeah, I mean, you, you <laughs> I just thought about this. You literally could put it in front of the other company we're talking about ads. <laughs> and our, you, you, you literally could put it right in front of there and say so sometimes you got to keep your feet on the pedal you know what I mean or something so like you literally could really really have a lot of fun with this and and uh and help people I love these ideas thank you this is awesome this is exactly what I was looking for well, good. We got maybe a couple more thoughts here. There was a so you mentioned Facebook and Instagram. Are you are, have you enabled the shoppable posts functionality? I think I have enabled that on definitely on Facebook, okay. uh, Instagram. I've got it set up. I've have my Instagram for business set up. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I'm good with that one. Um, yeah, I think I'm pretty good with those. Good. All right. So for people listening, if you know, if Angela's taking, if there's a, a photo in Instagram that includes the product, you can tag the product so then people can buy it directly from your Instagram feed. So I think that's, I always encourage people to do that. I think it's a, you just, it's there. Go, please do that. So if you don't have that done. And then the, the big one here is, um, you know, what about this giant e-commerce company, Amazon? Angela, so what is your what is your thoughts on on uh, selling your product on Amazon? So Road Trip Potty is not available on Amazon. Okay, all right. So, um, and I already knew that, so I'm a little spoiler alert for people. Um, so this is one where I would probably I, I would encourage you to sell this on Amazon, and I and we can talk about the pros and cons on it. But for me, the price point kind of feeds into a it's hard for you to, to market too much your own product on this one Amazon definitely takes a chunk of it but you can uh, you know most half of all e-commerce searches start on Amazon right now and that number might even be higher now um, but I feel like this is a product that people would be searching for on Amazon so there's mm -hmm. there's a um, I think you would probably you know maybe double triple maybe more sales on this uh, based on the price point, um, okay. but Amazon is a is a bit of a beast. So you know there is a you got to be ready for it. You got to be ready for reviews, and you do have to stock. Uh, well, you don't have to, but generally people will stock the product at Amazon using their fulfilled by Amazon Amazon FBA program. Um, so I would I would encourage it, um, and I would for anybody out there with a similar product that's you know. Potentially mass market and under 50 bucks. Well, and to Jesse's point too, um, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. We're not saying either or, right? You're, you're actually, actually on the equity commerce show. So we'd like the idea of you owning your own store, right? This isn't an either or, but you could do both. So mm -hmm. you can continue to fulfill the way you fulfill with your own store. But I also believe, um, you're one of those people just in the limited conversation we've had that 
regardless, you're going to do good things with your money. And so whether it's you do good things because you help people local in your town because you did it all on your own or whether you could distribute it to a larger group of people and get more shares and get more exposure and you get money and still do good things for the people in your town and people all over and people get paychecks at Amazon. It's not just a machine, although people think it's just a machine. <laughs> um, but <laughs> there are a lot of robots, but know, yes, there are, there are humans. there. Too. So again, we're just, we're kind of like a buffet friends. Uh, we don't get upset. We brought the broccoli salad. We won't get upset if you don't eat our broccoli salad, but we will bring our broccoli salad. So um, yeah, just, the metaphor is we just put out our ideas and take and pick what you think it'll work for you. But definitely, uh, I totally agree. It's a marketplace. You know, a lot of people that'll sell on, say they started out on Amazon or eBay and they say, well, I'm going to, I want to start my own store because I'm tired of these fees. And then they open up their own store and it's crickets because they don't realize they got a market to their own store where these other places are actually marketplaces where people go to buy things and so uh, just keep that in mind, whatever you choose, we wish you the best, um, but it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive is the bottom line of what I'm saying. And I'm glad you um, indicated that. Uh, and I'm also glad that you reminded me that there are people who work at Amazon, they work in fulfillment. And so everything that I've done with Road Trip Potty, if I'm not able to see and feel the human element to it, it's a lot harder for me to move forward with it. I mean, profits are important, but I do put people before profits. So I'm glad that you reminded me that there are people who work at Amazon and that by having Road Trip Potty um, being sold on Amazon or being available on Amazon, that I would be helping those as well. So thank you for that reminder. Oh, you're welcome. You never know. There could be super busy people in lifts that actually use them at Amazon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And actually, I'm so I just I wouldn't say I Googled it because I Amazon did or whatever. Uh, so I go to Amazon and I search female urinal. And yeah, I see all sorts of these funnel devices that you're talking about. Um they do not look like they would work well in a car. So I, I totally get it. And so you could, and again, I'm taking the pro Amazon side here. You know, you might be doing a disservice to the, all the women that are looking on Amazon for this product and you're not there. So, oh man, you had to do that. Too. Oh man. Yeah. That was just like <laughs> jam, you know, twisting the knife. Uh, so yes, I, I, <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm a marketing guy, so, uh, you know, I, I, <laughs> I had to say it. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to, you know, my goal is for you to be successful with your store, and I think there's a good good case for it. Um, but but yes, once you go there, you do have to deal with, there will there potentially are going to be copycats, and um, you got to kind of be on it. You can't just, you can't just push your stuff on Amazon and then walk away. You, you do need to be um, very proactive with, with Amazon, so... That's more of a note for everybody else listening as well. Like that Amazon is, uh, there's a lot of sales there, but it, you know, you don't make as much money and you do have to be, uh, you have to be on your game. So, yeah. Good to know. Thank you. So, um, Angela, any other questions we could answer for you or any help we could provide? You know, honestly, the, the feedback that you've given me regarding, um, marketing the videos, which is extremely important for me, um, making sure that I've got my shopping carts connected with Instagram, um, Facebook, uh, the ideas related to Google Maps and Waz and seeing if I can you know, somehow do the, the specific targeted marketing for women, um, especially when there are, are, are road conditions. These are fantastic ideas, and I, I had not pursued them. I had not really even thought of them prior to this conversation. So I'm super excited to get started with some research on this and moving some, some ideas forward. Awesome. That's, that's why we do the show. We just like to help and hope people listening are also getting some ideas for their store. So, Richard, any last questions? Uh, no, and I promise this is not premeditated but this is perfect timing we're ending because i really do have to go to the bathroom right 
<laughs> With that note, awesome. Angela, thanks for being on the show. Thanks, Thank Angela. Thank you. Well, Rich, there's another great show. And when you add it all together with the other shows, you won't miss any strategies or new tactics on how to grow your online business. So to make sure you don't miss anything, subscribe on your favorite podcast player. Rich, what player do you like? Uh, probably Stitcher. All how right. About, how about you? I'm, I'm an Apple podcast guy. I'm an Apple guy on that. Yeah. And we're growing right now. A listener asked us to add Google Play as a platform. So we just added that a couple of weeks ago. We have Spotify, SoundCloud. Nice. We're everywhere. So subscribe on your favorite platform and don't forget to rate and review us. So we know what you think. Yeah. Rate how we're doing. Review on what we have done. Tell us topics you'd like us to cover. Uh, tell us if you think we're great and you uh, are going to take over the world. Subscribe, rate, and review. It's the only way we'll know. And it keeps the shows coming. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>